All right, that is indeed Minister of State Jain Sinha in conversation here with Gauri Divedi of ET now. But let's take it across to our stellar panel and joining us in the show and to continue to remain with us, Mr. Dinesh Kanabar, Vivek Mishra. I also have Mukesh Bhutani joining us right here on ET now and Rohan Shah. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. Mr. Kanabar, let me begin with you very quickly. We were talking about... Uh, a revenue neutral rate of under 18 percent and I can proudly say that ET now was the first to tell its viewers earlier today that that is how it's going to be. Uh, some of you did express surprise uh, whether it's going to be under 18 percent the revenue neutral rate. 15 to 15 and a half percent is the range. Are you pleasantly surprised just at how low it has gone? Uh, I think uh, uh, to a large extent it is on expected lines. I think I agree with you that you were the first to come on board and, and make this comment about what the rates could be. But the, 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 the exemption rate of 12% and the standard rate of 17 to 18 and a half were both expected. I must say that, that the, uh, the, the luxury rate of 40% is slightly beyond what I had expected it to be. In fact, if you recollect our discussions earlier, we are looking at a rate of more like 32 to 36%. So 40 is, is, is a little bit high. Uh, the products which the, the, the uh, uh, chief economic advisor gave were aerated drinks, liquor, etc. So, so those are going to be a bit impacted. But overall, a very appropriate announcement. I would also welcome the elimination of the 1% GST, something which was expected as a concession. And I think that that's, that's the right way to go ahead. Mr. Bhutani, come in on this one. Um, they have really surprised, and like somebody in finance ministry told me earlier today, you will be pleasantly surprised with what the CA recommends. And on the basis of that, we had gone ahead and put forward the story that the rate will be under 18%. 15 to 15.5% is the revenue neutral rate, the standard rate in the range of about 17.8%. Uh, and of course, um, the, the concession rate uh, is really where things are, and that is in the range of 12%. Tax rate on precious metals 2 to 6 percent, demerit tax rate 14 percent, and that's the that's traditionally seen as a lot higher than it has been. Your first take on what uh, they are trying to say here? Yeah, I think I'm pleasantly surprised because I anticipated that the revenue neutral rate will be north of 18 uh, percent. So that seems to be certainly coming out as uh, a positive news. Uh, I think this uh, range that has been given is to allow flexibility states to move around insofar as the state GST is concerned. And uh, I think uh, states will make use of uh, this flexibility to be able to alter their rates uh, such that it does not impact their finances. All right, so pleasantly surprised because Mr. Bhutani, as he's rightly pointing out, was expecting rates of northwards. And Mr. Mishra, I think the discussion that we were having before we went ahead and had the CA was also this, uh, you know, 15 and a half half percent or 15 to 15 and a half percent is a rate that should pleasantly surprise Indian industry, you believe? And also makes uh, it economically yeah. and politically palatable for this to go through? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think there's one thing uh, that was uh, mentioned very clearly that uh, the RNR, the revenue neutral rate, is largely an academic exercise because uh, that is uh, the rate, uh, the single rate at which uh, we would be revenue neutral. So uh, then he went on to say that there would be a standard rate of 17 to 18 percent and that is the recommendation of the committee. So 15 to 15 and a half is not what we should be looking at, but 17 to 18, which, which I think is uh, is uh, stunning. It's it's very very welcome. Uh, uh, but uh, just that 15 uh, is not the rate. It's 17 or 18. That's the standard rate that the committee is uh, has recommended. And and it's absolutely uh, stunning. In a All right, absolutely stunning. stunning. So you're getting rate. a thumbs up from three big tax. Uh, Gurus, if I may, the tax big daddies here, all giving it a big thumbs up. Uh, Mukesh Bhutani, Dinesh Kanabar, and Vivek Mishra, we're going to get you quick reactions from India Inc. as well. But Mukesh Bhutani, let me now get down to the specifics, the basics of what has really been put out. Uh, the fact that the demerit tax, and that includes aerated drinks, it does not just include, uh, uh, you know, the high and luxury cars, it includes aerated drinks, it includes high and luxury, and it also includes tobacco cigarettes there. Uh, do you believe 40% is a tad too? high? Uh, will that dent consumption there? 
I don't know whether it will dent consumption, uh, but it seems to me that uh, the overriding concern uh, for the policy makers would have been impact of some of the uh, consumables uh, insofar as the health aspects are concerned. Uh, but certainly the 40% rate, uh, demerit rate seems to be on the higher side. Uh, I think uh, it would mean a significant or a material impact on the current rates that are applicable to those products. I do not have a comprehensive list of uh, uh, what kind of products to typically get covered in the demerit category, but if based on what you're reading out uh, seems to suggest that if products such as aerated water drinks are covered, uh, then I think it's on the higher side. Uh, you know, I won't be surprised insofar as tobacco and other products are concerned, uh, but certainly a 40% rate is on the right. higher side. Fair point. Just hold your thoughts there. We've got the first reactions coming in from India, Inc. And Kiran Majumdar Show, a very special guest, joins us on the phone line. Thank you very much for being with us uh, on the phone line patiently for that uh, uh, interaction, ma'am. 15 to 15 and a half percent is the revenue neutral rate. The standard rate at 17 to 18 percent and the concession rate is 12 percent. High tax is, of course, uh, up north, it's about 40 odd percent. Let me first get your initial reactions. Are you happy with the revenue neutral rate of 15 to 15 and a half percent? All right, we seem to be having being a weak line with her, and we've kind of lost her. But Dinesh Karabar, uh, like we were discussing with Mr. Butani, 40% is a tad too high, and he seems to agree there, and, and we've had a discussion on this. You know, gold is the debatable issue, really. Uh, there's always a big debate on gold, and on precious metals, the tax is between 2 to 6%. Of course, done with a view to curb black money and, you know, uh, to stop leak. But aren't you going to have leakages in the system with a 2 to 6%, Mr. Karabar? So, so I think uh, what the chief economic advisor stated, which I think was the most appropriate, that really the overall revenue collection, the ability to give concessions will depend on what is the rate that we are going to put on commodities. The range of 2 to 6 percent uh, is of course indeed a very, very wide range. Uh, choices will need to be made by the council on, on where do we want to go, different commodities, different prices. Uh, a, a 2 percent uh, tax on gold is not something which I see as being terribly different from, from where we are. All right, I've got Kiran Majumdar's show, and that's the first reaction that's coming in from India Inc., who's joining us on the phone line. Thank you very much for being with us, ma'am. 15 to 15 and a half percent is the revenue neutral rate, and of course, um, you know, a concession rate of 12 percent, a standard rate of 17 to 18 percent, which is also on the lower side. What do you make of this? Is this a thumbs up uh, coming from the first reactions that we're getting from India Inc., ma'am? Well, I think these, you know, the 18% uh, rate level was indicated as a, as a reasonable level for the government to look at. And I think the uh, uh, revenue neutral rate that they've come out with is a very reasonable rate. And I think by and large, I think it will depend on what the GST council finally, uh, uh, you know, comes out with. But I think uh, the band that the government has given is something that they can play around with. Uh, could you come again on that answer? You said the band given? I think the band given to the, the, to the committee to play around with is, is, is fairly doable. Do you believe a 15 to 15 and a half percent revenue neutral rate also makes it politically palatable? Economically, of course, it's a sound decision because most states are going to be on board. But is it also going to ensure that most political parties will get on board with a rate like this? I would imagine so, because I think it is in the best interest of, uh, you know, the, the, the economy in terms of uh, basically making sure that consumption is also, uh, you know, kick-started. And I think even in terms of, uh, you know, the, the imposition of GST rates on products uh, in terms of uh, uh, revenue uh, for the government also uh, is important. So I think this strikes a right balance. 
What do you make of the three subcategories that have been given in this recommendation? They're talking about a concessional rate, they're talking about a standard rate, and of course then there is that demerit tax which involves aerated drinks. So the Chief Economic Advisor doesn't want us to have the colas really. But what do you make of these three categories? Is this going to add to the complexity or do you believe this is perhaps the right way going forward because the consumption really varies around this, these three categories? I think it would be better for them to simplify it as much as possible. Having three categories just um, g provides the kind of opportunity to keep adding and, you know, creating more categories. So I think it would be very important just to stick with, uh, you know, concessional rates and uh, standard rates. And I think that would be a better way of looking at, uh, you know, the GST rather than keeping on adding new categories. Because the moment you start categories, uh, there is a tendency to take advantage of that particular provision, and then you will see many, many more subcategories added. That's that's absolutely right. Many people in in North Block also believe that exemptions will release, uh, re, you know, uh, relate to rent seekers. A very quick question before I take it across to our panels, ma'am. It has also recommended the abolition of that one percent additional levy that the original draft had talked about, and that was the big bone of contention between the BJP and the Congress party. Do you believe this is the biggest giveaway that that one percent additional levy is going to go, and perhaps the GST is going to be able to break the political logjam? I hope so, because I think uh, GST is uh, long overdue. I think it will bring in a lot of rationality and, rash, uh, you know, a good uh, uh, fair, uh, fairness in the whole uh, taxation system. It will actually see a better tax realization in terms of the present, uh, you know, uh, taxes that are not being paid. It, it, it also uh, basically uh, will, uh, you know, bring in much more equity in the way uh, you know, uh, intertax uh, goods are traded. So I think it is very good for a federated system to have a uniform taxation system. Fair point indeed. And you do believe that's a good step because if it's about making India one market, you've got to uh, abolish that 1% levy. But are you a little disappointed with how the demerit tax has been placed? 40%, my panel here believes, is, is a lot too high. And you're including luxury items there. You're including tobacco and cigarettes. And you're also including things like aerated drinks. Is 40% a little too high for that highest range? I do believe that is very high. I think they need to be, uh, there needs to be some debate and discussion on this. And I think aerated drinks, again, I think we need to basically look at what we're doing about aerated drinks, and we can't club them along with, uh, you know, tobacco and uh, alcohol and other such uh, items. Ms. Kiran Majumdar Shaw, thank you very much for taking time out this evening and being with us. Uh, let's take it back to our panel. And uh, Mr. Bhutani, I'll, I'll come to you because, you know, that 1% additional tax, that is really the big bone of contention between the two political sides. Uh, the CA panel seems to recommend here that that should be abolished. And I think that's the big giveaway, that the government is willing to walk that extra mile to get that abolished, to get it out of the system. What do you make of this? Do you believe this is the one master stroke and we will perhaps see that 1% go through and the Congress will come on board? Board. Well, I don't know that's a political debate whether Congress will come on board, but uh, certainly that's 1% uh, uh, issue was raised by the select committee. But, you know, stepping back a little bit, uh, you, should, uh, you should look into the background of this 1% tax. Uh, the 1% tax was essentially a compromise uh, between the central government and those state governments which were... Uh, you know, producing or manufacturing goods which primarily comprised of uh, the states of Haryana, Gujarat, uh, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. Uh, the industry viewed the 1% levy as regressive because that 1% levy, levy was a simple cost uh, with uh, no uh, credits or uh, set-offs being available because it was not entering uh, the GST chain. Uh, I think that in a way uh, the fact that the GST debate uh, lasted for a long and the matter went back to the select committee and the select committee put its foot down and finally now uh, the government, well, I am hoping that the government accepts it but, you know, finally now at least the chief economic advisor's report on rates has suggested 
dropping this 1% is certainly positive. It is positive for the industry. Now, if it in the overall process, it aids uh, or takes away uh, a, uh, one of the three contentious issues that were raised by the select panel and propels for the passage of the constitutional bill, it certainly is a welcome uh, uh, you know, a dis a decision. But I would say that uh, this is more positive for the industry uh, in, in the first place and of course the, if it has any positive impact on the passage, safe passage of the GST bill, uh, that's a, a secondary impact I would say. All right, that's a secondary impact, but like you're saying, that's one item down as far as the bone of contentions is concerned. We also have Rohan Shah, Managing Partner, Economic Law Practices as ELP. Uh, Rohan, what do you make of this 1% additional levy and recommendation that that should be abolished? Something that we were discussing with Mr. Bhutani here. Very positive, because obviously this was that one lingering issue politically. And, you know, once you take this away... Uh, you are moving much closer to political consensus and this 1% in any case is something which through the compensation mechanism could be made available. So clearly taking away the 1% or recommending that is a big step forward and I think you know, this will help achieve consensus in this session of parliament. Vivek Mishra, you want to come in on that? I particularly wanted to also discuss the other factors that 1% additional levy is, yes, uh, very well taken. But what about precious metals? And we were just talking about that, how gold is a politically palatable subject. Yeah, I mean, sorry, politically very concurrent subject, you know. Uh, it, it is a debatable issue, 2 to 6%. Isn't that, uh, are you comfortable with that range? Vivek? You know, the thing is, uh, yeah, uh, the thing is that... Uh, we can uh, we can sit and debate about uh, the rate should be this or that. Uh, I think what we have to recognize is that uh, uh, political compulsions, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the taxation history of uh, a particular commodity. I mean, these are realities. Uh, so is it a reality that we have to uh, find a way to uh, uh, to balance the the budget or to uh, make sure that we don't take. Uh, 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 big chances in terms of revenue. So uh, two to six percent. I actually don't uh, don't have an answer there. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, what rate would uh, uh, would be acceptable. Uh, the the 18 percent rate, 17 to 18 percent. That's that's really really uh, a positive step. Uh, this one percent uh, 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 additional tax that uh, was uh, uh, to be levied. I think the if that is withdrawn, uh, which is what the uh, the panel has uh, recommended, that's very positive from uh, from a couple of uh, uh, points of view. One is that uh, it was proposed to be there for two years or such time as the uh, GST council might recommend. So. I had uh, doubts that uh, if it became a reality that it would actually go away in uh, two years. Uh, the fact that, uh, or, uh, that, the, uh, that the committee has recommended that it should go away, it should not be imposed, is very positive from that uh, point of view. I, I don't think it's realistic that it can be imposed uh, at a, a, a later stage. And uh, like I said, the 2 to 6 percent, I mean, one can debate. Fair point indeed. Mr. Kalabar, I'm going to come to you on the other recommendations that have been made. And of course, we haven't seen petroleum and alcohol be a part of the GST uh, ambit in the first place. But the recommendations from the CEA panel, and which really had the blessings of North Block, is that it is advisable to bring petroleum, alcohol, real estate, and electricity under the ambit of the GST going forward. Do you think it's going to be at all possible? You're not starting with petroleum and alcohol, and then to recommend that you should bring it around uh, in the near future. Will states agree to this at all? Because many people believe the reason why the states are perhaps and why the GST is gathering traction is because you have kept petroleum and alcohol out. So if you, if you have heard the chief economic advisor very carefully, what he mentioned was that the recommendation has been that as many products and services as possible should be covered and what should be left out should be de minimis. 
and when he said that while he did not speak about uh, uh, petroleum and alcohol i thought he did imply without mentioning that that those are the two likely things which are likely to be kept out i would like to believe that uh, it's it's very unlikely that in the first stage we will see these two are getting included in the gst regime uh, and 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 as i said as i said the the statement of the chief economic advisor was almost a giveaway on that Right, right, right. I, I want to get in Mukesh Bhutani also in this one. Mr. Bhutani, you very often are found in the corridors of power, and so it's only fair to ask you, alcohol and petroleum are known starters to begin with. Do you emphasize the situation based on these recommendations that they can ever be made a part of the uh, GST, at least in the near future, two to three years? Not in the short term. Uh, uh and i don't think that the exclusion of alcohol and uh, and and the petroleum products uh, should surprise us uh, because i don't think that was expected i think there's a more philosophical debate over here that if the government wants to bring all the states on board for these two levies then we can keep on going debating gst for the next 5 years and i promise you it will not happen and there are reasons for that the reasons for that are different Let's look at alcohol products. Uh, levy of indirect tax on alcohol products uh, is a significant part of revenues uh, for many many state governments, and I do not see uh, the state governments giving up uh, because they view that as giving up an important empowerment that they have, which is their right to collect tax on alcoholic products. If you look at the debate uh, on GST. uh with the earlier government i think one of the aspects that worried states was that will states be robbed of their empowerment whether it is by way of delegation of authority to the gst council or the vote in the gst council or the right to determine the rates so on and so forth i think this government realized uh, uh, some of the challenges that were faced by the earlier government in terms of bringing uh, all the states on board and i don't think that this government debated even uh, yes in an ideal scenario if you're looking at a gst which mirrors the gst in many parts of continental europe you should have alcohol uh, and petroleum products but that's not going to be the case and it's not going to be the case because of historical reasons reasons because of the way a gst debate has happened in the past decade so i don't see uh in the short term inclusion of these two products and i don't think the government should try and attempt to bring that debate because it will just delay the implementation of the gst law that's a very very pragmatic view that's coming in from you and i i, I really appreciate that because you really understand how policy making does happen uh that's absolutely right the government cannot afford to perhaps bring that back but i did see rohan shah's finger go up while you were talking and let me quickly ask you you have a view there on keeping alcohol out of the gst ambit rohan you know it is unusual that uh, we are going to leave out some items but this has been on the books for a long time it's also part of it is reflected at least in terms of alcohol in the constitutional entry itself so i think this was the writing on the wall this is what has come but there is a message and undertone in terms of what mr subramaniam said which is that you know he thinks all products should come in as soon as possible so maybe the take away is that while these will not be included up front you know over a period of time and they will find a way to bring these into the gst net all right let's really take this beyond what the recommendations are and some things that are really holding back the gst from becoming a reality at least in india we will hopefully see this pass through the winter session but vivek if i may ask you the congress's second demand was that you should make the cap on the gst rate a part of the constitutional amendment bill is that going to be possible at all can the government give in on that my own sources seem to suggest that is not going to be possible you have to bu budget in for exigencies there may be emergencies you cannot go back and amend the constitution each time is that an unreasonable demand according to you well uh, the congress had uh, three key uh, demands uh, one was uh, the uh the voting in the gst council the second was the removal of the 1% tax and the third was an 18% uh, uh, cap on uh, uh, on the gst rate coupled with the fact that it would be built into the uh, constitution i think i i thought that uh, the first two demands were 
completely achievable uh, the removal of 1% and the uh, change of uh, more representation to the states in the uh, GST council I thought the 18% standard rate was extremely difficult to achieve, but it looks like we're on our way to uh, implementing that. So that really leaves uh, building it into the Constitution. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, the Congress would uh, uh, give in on that uh, aspect. I don't think it can be uh, done that way. And, uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, it would be probably perceived uh, by industry, uh, if they uh, if they talk tough on that, it would probably be perceived as a bit uh, unreasonable. So, so I think that will uh, that uh, demand will go away. That that, that would be my uh, view. Mr. Karnabar, I'm going to throw some political uh, inside details at you. Apparently, Rahul Gandhi met a whole host of FIIs, and they all in unison said that the one thing that's going to propel growth is GST. So you do expect the GST to go through, even from the Congress's point of view. They cannot be seen as obstructing this reform anymore, considering they call themselves the author of this. Do you believe they will continue to harp on uh, the amendment, the Constitution Amendment Bill carrying a cap rate on the GST? I'm going to take up another question on dispute resolution in just a bit. <clears throat> uh, well, I, I'm not a, a political person and I'm in no position to answer uh, that, but the way I see it, uh, as, as we all have articulated, that there were certain key economic reasons which were put together as to why the Congress was want opposing the passage of GST. And if you see, three of those four have now gone past. The only thing which is remaining is the putting of the rate in, in, the, in the amendment bill itself. And I think, uh, you know, you earlier spoke about this 1% elimination of GST. If you heard uh, Mr. Arvind Subramaniam, he was very categorical that on the basis of the calculations that have been done, they are very clear that the collections will be revenue neutral. We are not going to see any deficit. If that is the situation, there is no room to believe that this 17 to 18 percent is going to be tempered every year. The only reason why one would want a rate uh, in a constitution amendment bill is really to sort of ensure that the rate is not tempered with. And I think even Congress would understand that as you go along, there may be not only exigencies, there may be situations where if tomorrow they were to be in power, they might want to change the rate. So I don't think one needs to bind oneself to change. I think so long as the key issues are taken care of, I think this is not such a critical demand. All right, not such a critical demand. Uh, Mukesh Batali, the other demand of the Congress party is about the dispute resolution mechanism. Mr. Chidambaram himself had suggested, and there seems to be going, a little bit of going back on this, that the council should decide what should be done with the dispute, and if they cannot, they should decide where the dispute should be, uh, in fact, resolved. Uh, do you believe uh, that is a thorny issue? And, and, and how important is that issue, really, as far as the whole GST regime itself is concerned? So can disputants be a part of the dispute resolution itself? I'll just, Sophia, cover the other point, uh, whether the 18% rate uh, should be mentioned in the constitutional amendment or not. I think the question we should ask ourselves is not how reasonable or unreasonable that demand is, but how practical that demand is. I mean, if, 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 if it is reasonable, then I think we should go ahead and put down our corporate tax rates in the constitution. I think, uh, in my view, it's an impractical, uh, uh, you know, demand uh, by the select panel, uh, and and put that out as a condition uh, for the passage of the GST constitutional amendment. As far as the empowerment of the GST council is concerned, uh, the role played by uh, state governments is concerned, the role the role played by the uh, central government is concerned, and this is the point I was trying alluding earlier, that if you look at the draft. Uh, uh, you know, division of uh, powers that was circulated in the 2012 version. At that point in time, states were not supporting because they felt that there is a shift of power from the state to the central government. I personally feel that there's been a lot of compromise that was made not just by this government, but even in the earlier draft by Mr. Chidambaram when he took over. Uh, in his capacity, capacity as a finance minister in 2012 and I think that there is uh, a reasonableness over here I don't think uh, this is a thorny issue any longer uh, uh, you know at the end of the day uh, there has to be someone at the federal level 
who has to decide on the issue, uh, who has to arbitrate on the issue, whether that is arising out of uh, issues on rate of tax, which I don't think will arise, the fact that a flexibility of 1% has been given to the state, or it's arising out of any other issue. So I think in my view, uh, this hardly remains as a debatable issue. Uh, if you look, take into consideration the ra larger message that is coming in by leadership at the highest political level as to what does, what do they feel about cooperative federalism, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the, the current uh, uh, formula for uh, empowerment of the state government in the GST council is in any manner lopsided or there should be any fundamental change that should be carried out or at least uh, that should not hold back the passage of the GST constitutional amendment. Fair point indeed. Always the voice is standing there. But Rohan Shah, let's quickly do a quick round of uh, brief answers here. Do you think the government can still pass the bill before the April 2016 deadline? Do you think it can go through in the winter session? Can the government meet the deadline? Well, I think government is, you know, shown an immense amount of energy on this issue. It's been doing a lot of issue, a lot of uh, work. And from the government perspective, I think they will do their very best to get everything that they need to do, you know, done earliest and in my estimate probably by uh, you know either the first of april or even a little earlier but to implement you need to give industry a reasonable period of time i think industry at least deserves to get six months so while i think they will have the superstructure in place by the first of april uh, implementation by first of april i think may be a challenge that realistically may be more the first of october 2016. All right, uh, Vivek Vishal, do you have a quick word on this one? April 1, 2016, is that too ambitious a target? Shouldn't industry have more time? Is, can the government rush into this one? Because this is not the end of the road as far as the GST is concerned. Yes, I think uh, uh, April uh, uh, 2016 is, is not uh, realistic because uh, <clears throat> the Constitution has to be amended. And then uh, the center has to enact uh, the GST law, and then uh, 29 states have to enact it. So, uh, so the uh, the amount of legislative uh, action that is needed makes uh, April 1, uh, 16 a little unrealistic. And uh, uh, frankly, the uh, this is such a momentous uh, reform that uh, whether it's uh, April 1 uh, or it's uh, uh, six months later, it really doesn't matter much in the larger picture. Uh, of course, uh, in, in a small term uh, uh, kind of uh, way of thinking, uh, it could be uh, it could be seen as uh, disappointing, etc. But uh, I, I don't think April uh, 16 is uh, is at all realistic. And I think uh, uh, if uh, if and when the uh, uh, when the constitution is amended, then industry uh, will know that this is on its way and uh, will do uh, everything that's needed to, to prepare and, and that's great. Mr. Karnabar, you want to come in on that? Uh, th this is not the end of the road. The Constitution Amendment Bill, then the IGST, the CGST, the SGST, then of course the Council will have to decide upon things. 50% of the states have to ratify. Administrative changes need to be made. You still think India can keep its date on April 1, 2016? And, and if at all it can't, should investors be disappointed? Or is it just a date line that will be missed? Eventually, we are going to see this game-changing reform uh, do take shape in India. I think the entire question that you are putting is focus on whether the legislative framework can be ready or not. But I think to the point which was made earlier, the, 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 the burden of the cross is on the shoulders of the industry. Uh, that we have been talking about GST now for ad nauseum. Uh, industry has started to carry out impact analysis, uh, sort of look at how they need to tweak their IT systems. From an industry perspective, this means a sea change because there are things on which you could take credit earlier which you can't now or vice versa. You need to restructure your entire supply chain management. So uh, three things need to happen. First, industry needs to ensure compliance. And for compliance, things, the whole process needs to be in place. Second, the IT infrastructure needs to be in place. And third, 
industries are going to reinvent themselves because they're, they're going to really look at this as a game changing thing for their own and there'll be a huge amount of consultative process as I said either on the supply chain management buy versus lease number of those decisions will have to be revisited and those can't be done in six months time so it is not really important to say whether the legislative framework will be there or not but what is the time that it will take for the industry to now go back and really put its uh, house and IT infrastructure in order and that's where I would think that we would need about uh, uh, less than a year from now and therefore first October 16 looks like a more realistic date. All right, not the 1st April, but the 1st October of 2016, which is a three-month delay, does look more optimistic. Mukesh Bhutani, let you have the final word on this discussion and debate on the GST. Is life all set to change for corporate India? Is India finally going to be one market? Uh, I'm throwing many questions to you, but, but is India finally going to be one uniform market? Is life all set to change for corporate India and more than anything else? Will we see the winter logjam break for the BGST? Well, I hope so. I echo uh, sentiments of all the three uh, panelists uh, that was mentioned earlier. I'd just like to supplement it with two points. I think industry recognizes very well that uh, the coming in of the GST law is not just about a change in the manner of levy of indirect tax or change in the rates of indirect tax. It is, a transform it is called a transformational reform because it means carrying out fundamental changes in the way you do your business. Uh, in terms of uh, where you manufacture, uh, you know, where you warehouse, how you distribute, so on and so forth. So that's one part of it. To your earlier question, are investors going to be disappointed uh, if we don't meet the April uh, 2016 deadline? In my view, certainly not. I think what investors are really looking out for is this crucial passage of the GST bill. Yes, they will be disappointed if the GST constitutional amendment does not go through having traveled so far. And to your last question, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, if the choice is between having a perfect GST versus having a GST in the manner that we have, I think we are better off with the latter. I think it will take uh, three to five years' time for all the stakeholders uh, to go through a steep learning curve uh, to understand not just the nuances of the new law, but also uh, understand the uh, issues that will come up. I think it's going to take uh, three to five years for a law of this nature to settle down uh, and I personally feel that this is truly transformational if you are able to get through this last mile uh, I think uh, over a period of time in the short to medium term India would clearly be viewed as one single market Fair point indeed. Mukesh Patani, Dinesh Kanabar, Vivek Mishra and Rohan Shah, we really appreciate you taking time out this evening and being with us on what we are calling the big game-changing reform. This, many people believe, is the mother of all economic reforms in India, and that is indeed the GST. Thank you very much for sparing time and being with us. But let's take it across to the man in North Block who will be a part of the GST implementation.